Welcome to the Brighton Heights Vitality Series. This is our first episode, episode one. And we thought it would be very timely to have this first episode be about fortifying your immune system. How to, you know, what are the steps for that? We wanna thank you all again for joining. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by Brighton Heights. And Brighton Heights will be the first of a kind senior living community. Uh, it's gonna be located in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. And, which is just outside of Louisville. And it's the, the whole concept with this community is to promote the healthy lifestyle culture. And so the Vitality Series will be all about that concept. Um, and the, 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 uh, the goal for that would be to open sometime in 2024. So we have four years to go, but we wanted to go ahead and get started in connecting with the community at large to really be about sharing information about what uh, the possibilities are with healthy lifestyle. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna introduce our guests, but first I just wanna uh, talk about a few housekeeping items. All microphones are to be muted, or they already are muted, I should say. So if you have questions throughout this uh, webinar, just type them into the chat window. And if you're joining us through either Facebook Live or YouTube Live, feel free to just leave your questions in the comments. Katie Custer, who uh, has her picture highlight hidden, but here she is. So wave to everybody, Katie. She will be monitoring the questions and uh, we're gonna talk for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna cut ourselves off and say, okay, let's see what questions we have that we wanna make sure we get to. So she's gonna raise those questions for us. So to start off, my name is Susan Pena and I am part of the team that is planning this community called Brighton Heights. And I'm just very excited about bringing this healthy lifestyle culture concept to the senior living community environment and what that possibility will be for residents that live in senior living communities. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Scott Edens, who is the president of Potentia Living, so he can introduce himself. Well, thank you, Susan. I'm glad to be here today. Um, I do serve as the president of a, a nonprofit that's located in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky, and um, has gone by the name uh, the Rural Educational Association of Kentucky for 96 years. And with the uh, development of this property, we are transitioning into a new sponsoring organization called Potentia Living. And I'm just excited uh, to be here today and, and get to hear uh, Dr. Wes Youngberg uh, talk about a, a vital topic, and um, Susan, I'll give it back to you. All right, thank you. So let me just take a moment to introduce Dr. Russ Youngberg. Uh, many of you that are joining us are familiar with him and probably been following him for quite a while, but for those of you who have not, Dr. Youngberg is a clinical nutritionist and lifestyle medicine specialist. Uh, he is practicing lifestyle medicine and clinical nutrition in Southern California and Temecula, which I think you've told me is in between San Diego and Loma Linda. Is that fair? Um, okay. He was trained at Loma Linda University where he received a master's in nutrition and a doctorate of public health and preventative care. He is also an assistant clinical professor at the School of Medicine and Public Health at Loma Linda University. He is a fellow and founding director of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which I do hope you'll take a moment at some point to just explain that organization, because I think that'll be very interesting to a lot of people. And he sees patients in his office and online. I think you've told me it's more online these days uh, at the Youngberg Lifestyle Medicine Clinic near San Diego. In 2018, the Jour American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine published uh, Dr. Youngberg's paper called Clinical Lifestyle Medicine Strategies for preventing and reversing memory loss in Alzheimer's. Uh, he has trained with noted neurologist, Dr. Del Bredesen, is certified in the Bredesen Protocol and, and has developed a 15 hour, 15 hour Vimeo series called Reignite Recognition, which I have gone through many times with other uh, uh, people. Just it's an excellent program on things that you can do to help reverse cognitive decline. More recently, he co-authored with Dr. Bredesen in the Journal of Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism, a paper documenting reversal of cognitive decline in 100 patients. He's authored three books, uh, the first one called Goodbye Diabetes, Preventing and Reversing Diabetes the Natural Way, Hello Healthy, Strategies to Reach Our Full Health and Wellness Potential, 
and his more, most recent book called Memory Makeover, How to Prevent Alzheimer's and Reverse Cognitive Decline. And he's a speaker for the online diabetes reversal program, Diabetes Undone, as well as other diabetes reversal programs from what I understand as well. So welcome, Dr. Youngberg. Any opening remarks you'd like to make? <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Well, you know, I just, I was mentioning to uh, the group before we started uh, just this morning, I had the privilege to uh, be part of a panel with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine as we're, as we're training other groups and other conferences, uh, doctors and policymakers and other conferences about the possibility to reverse diabetes, not just manage it. And, uh, and so that was uh, in Qatar. Uh, Middle East, a uh, big uh, virtual conference. And so I did that from, from this very seat this morning, and now we're doing another one uh, for, for our group here. The, the connection between diabetes and what our topic today, which is you know, how to optimize the immune system and, and how to limit our personal risk of respiratory infections, especially nowadays with COVID getting out of control as we speak, what can we do right now at home uh, to protect ourselves, both from a preventive standpoint and a management or therapeutic standpoint? So uh, we were going we're gonna to talk more next month. We'll talk about this at the end of today's uh, uh, webinar about the interrelationships between diabetes, Alzheimer's, and, and COVID-19 or, or infections. But... Um, a big study just released showed that for every 20 point increase in somebody's fasting blood sugars, that increased the risk of death from an infection with COVID by 13%. That's every 20 points, another 13% increased risk of dying if you get infected. And so that's why, you know, in this vitality series, it's all about what we know and what we're able to implement now. Uh, which could make the difference between you sailing right through an infection with COVID or actually ending up at the hospital and dying from it. And so our goal is to bring vitality now and limit the risk for any of that happening. Awesome. That is so awesome. Well, great. That's a great uh, lead in. And I, I think uh, the first question we'd like to ask you, so we're going to do this interview style uh, <laughs> with this topic. As you just mentioned, the most vulnerable individuals to COVID are those with compromised immune systems. You mentioned diabetes, but really we've heard in the news over and over again, compromised immune systems. So the qu first question I, I have is why is that? Why compromised immune systems makes you so vulnerable to COVID? Well, what's interesting is that the very nature of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 compromises the immune system. So everybody who gets sick with COVID, everybody gets infected with COVID actually ends up with, uh, in part, a compromised immune system. There's actually two phases to, to the illness, if you will. The first phase is just viral replication. You don't even know you have it for the first five days on average. It could be longer, but you could be, you could be infected and you're feeling great and you're, the virus is just replicating nonstop because the virus has this innate ability to suppress what we call the innate immune system. It just shuts it down. So, so the immune system thinks that everything's fine. And so like the, the, the soldiers are on R&R &R while the, the villages are being destroyed by the enemy. And so that's, that's the first thing that there's a viral phase. And then, the second phase is what we call an inflammatory phase. So people who already have a compromised immune system to begin with now get double compromised when they get infected. And, and, and individuals with, with diabetes, we just pointed out, are much more compromised uh, uh, just to begin with for a lot of reasons. And, and so it's important to understand the difference between what we call the innate immune system, which is the part of the immune system which is licensed to kill. It's just, it, it, if it runs into a bad guy, it's, li it's licensed to kill it right away. Uh, but see, the innate immune system loses its strength as we get older. Mm. And this is one of the reasons why 
why age is actually one of the biggest risk factors for, uh, uh, for succumbing to COVID-19. And, uh, but there's things that we can do. As we get older, we tend to have more and more complicating health issues like diabetes, like uh, uh, overweight or obesity. Uh, ironically, obesity is one of the biggest risk factors for this. And there's some clues there that the more we weigh, the, the more of the vitamin D that we take in from sun exposure during the summer or even the supplements during the winter, fall and winter actually get stored in the fat, rendering them useless. So that, that's, that's one of the clues here is that we need to be, especially if you have underlying medical conditions, heart, heart disease, hypertension, uh, diabetes, whatever, uh, uh, overweight uh, or obesity, you need more vitamin D on a daily basis because a lot of that is getting used up or it's getting stored in fat cells where it doesn't do a thing for you. Wow. Okay. That makes sense. Um, Scott, did you uh, want to ask a question or I think you, you had some information you wanted to share too. Oh, Scott, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, Susan, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Youngberg, I was thinking in leading up to this uh, webinar that there might be individuals on here um, that might just fit some of that description that you, you gave, uh, maybe age, seniors, and uh, or, or have an experience like me where um, I happen to lose uh, someone very close to me uh, to the virus uh, a month or so ago. And I hope today uh, that we're going to be able to talk about steps that we as individuals can take and maybe share some of those steps that we could take to prepare for such uh, a strong illness that, that compromises the immune system, you know. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, it, not a day goes by, Scott, when I'm not uh, either texted or called or somebody in my office says, you know, I, I have a close friend or relative that's COVID. What do we do? You know, I had, uh, I had a patient over the weekend, um, um, I was actually during, doing virtual church <laughs> and uh, I got a text from uh, one of my patients said, hey, I just found out I tested positive. What do I do? And, and so the, the, the real issue here is that we're all susceptible at some level. This virus is so infectious that eventually we're all going to get exposed. So it's reasonable to limit our exposure, right, in our, our, the dose that we get exposed to. It's reasonable to do that. But understand that this whole idea of flattening the curve that was so popular an idea in, in March and April, the, the intent of that was never to decrease the total number of people who got infected. The, the whole intent was to decrease the number of people who got infected right away to flatten the curve. There's still just as many people who get infected it's just extended over a longer period of time so the hospital does not get overwhelmed initially. Fortunately, now our hospitals have had a chance to gear up to figure out what to do and what not to do. And our, our, our hospital system is much more capable now of, of properly treating individuals who, who come down with severe symptoms that require hospitalization. But they, the real challenge here, Scott, is that the majority of people infected with the virus do not qualify to go to the hospital until it's almost too late. So, so that, that's the real key point. In other words, what can we do at home right now to prevent, uh, if, we, if we get a, a chance exposure, are we... Are we preventing that uh, from leading to a severe illness or ending up in the hospital? Uh, or are we just hoping that we don't get infected when in fact, we're probably all gonna get infected eventually. So the, that's why we need to have, we need to, to develop guidelines for our families and our, our communities 
which protect the vulnerable and make sure that those of us that are most vulnerable uh, are doing the simple things at home or wherever we are to that, that greatly protects us. So, um, so there, there's some simple things that we, we, we could do immediately. Now, uh, let me, let me, there's, there's what we call natural remedies, like lifestyle medicine type remedies. And then there's what we call simple remedies. These are things that we can do very simply, but they have a powerful effect on our immune system right away. Um, a, a, a just real briefly, natural remedies would include what, what many, many of us refer to as the, the, uh, the, the new start principles, right? The nutrition, exercise, getting plenty of water, uh, the get, getting plenty of sunshine, uh, uh, being, being temperate, you know, don't, don't overdo any one thing and avoid the things that are clearly uh, bad for us. Uh, uh, getting plenty of fresh air, getting plenty of rest, and, and of course, trusting in God and, and learning how to forgive and not being stressed out. We know that just being stressed out, simply being stressed about COVID-19 is enough to make you get you sick with COVID-19 compared to somebody who's not stressed. So your immune system, when stressed, is much more likely to succumb to the infection and develop more severe symptoms. So those, those in very brief um, uh, detail are the natural remedies, and, and they're fundamental. They're critical that, that, and, and you know, very important. But there's some simple remedies as well, Scott, and, and, and those are some of the things that clinically we can recommend right away. I, I've been reading what other countries have been doing in preparation for the, this, this uh, extended wave. Some people say we're not really out of the first wave yet because of the flattening of the curve. We're just, we're just in the, uh, the, the, the wave keeps rippling through. We're not done with wave one, with the first wave, even though some people say we're in the second wave. Either way, we're in a wave, right? That, that means that more and more and more people are getting infected especially during the colder months of the year. Uh, so so there, there's, again, some simple things that, that we can do. And the first thing that I always think of is, an, is a simple remedy is optimize vitamin D levels. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about whether this is premature or whether we have enough research. Let me tell you, I've been researching vitamin D for viral infections and other infections and, and boosting the immune system for a tremendous amount of time, for over 20 years. And, and let me just say from my perspective as a lifestyle medicine specialist, we don't need more, more studies. I mean, I'm all in favor of more studies, but we don't need more studies in order to make a decision, okay? The, the, we, we have plenty, the smoking gun is smoking really, really a lot right now. We know that optimizing vitamin D powerfully improves your chances of, um, of having, if infected, having just the very mild symptoms as opposed to critical severe symptoms. Here's, here's one study in particular that, that was just, just mind boggling. And, and essentially this study showed that the likelihood of you having a very mild illness with COVID-19 is 20 times greater, okay, compared to a very severe illness if your vitamin D levels are high. In other words, flip wow. that around. The likelihood of you becoming severely ill requiring intensive care and ventilator support and, and, and potentially dying is 20 times 20 fold greater than if you, than if you had, uh, if you have a low vitamin D level. Okay. Uh, that, that should be the only study we need right there. Okay. That, and that's, that's a powerful, powerful statement. But in fact, there are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of studies, not just general immune boosting, but specifically related to COVID-19. Let me actually let me actually show you one study that comes to mind right now that, that was done by, by Professor Michael Hollick from Boston University, who's, who's one of the vitamin D gurus. You know, he, 
uh, he, he's been talking about this since I first learned about it 20 years ago, and he's been doing research after research study on this. What he did is he, he took 192,000 people that were part of the, 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 the NHANES data, the U.S. government data, individuals that had a vitamin D blood level done in the last year, uh, and, and who had been tested for COVID-19. And so it's, it was a, a perfect retrospective analysis of the data to determine, is there an, a relationship between how high your blood vitamin D levels are and your risk of even getting infected or testing positive with, uh, with COVID? And and here's the data. This is profound. If your blood levels of vitamin D were officially deficient, which means less than 20 nanograms per deciliter, okay, and, and that's really low. I'm telling my patients, I want them somewhere between 60 and 80 or even higher and up to 100. Upper third of the normal range, and the normal range is 30 to 100. So, so I'm telling my patients, get it up there. Of course, I'm dealing with patients who have health issues, right, who who have health concerns. And so I want to make sure that as far as vitamin D, we're optimizing that specific strategy while we also optimize all the other strategies, right? We don't just put our, uh, you know, all our emphasis on vitamin D and yet it's the simplest and maybe most profound strategy that everybody can take advantage of. Uh, just, just this weekend, we actually passed out, our, my clinic, we just passed out vitamin D bottles, the liquid vitamin D bottles to every single family in our church, just free. Okay. And it was, it was, I wish it was my idea. It was my wife's idea. He says, you know, you keep talking about how government should be giving this out free. He says, why don't we do it? I go like, right. Great idea. Right. So we did that. And, and now nobody has the excuse. And plus we gave them a handout, right? A handout on how to use vitamin D properly. And as a preventive and a therapeutic, if they were exposed, you know, what do you do? If you're, if you're uh, infected, what do you do? If you're really feeling sick, what do you do? Uh, and so there's different levels of, of intervention with vitamin D on that. So, so he, here's, the, here's the data from Dr. Michael Hollick um, uh, uh, published just in September of 2020. He said, he found that of these 192,000 individuals, if the vitamin D level was less than 20, 12.5% of those individuals tested positive for COVID, okay? If their vitamin D level was a little higher, between 30 and 34, that dropped by a whole 30% down to 8.1%. 12.5 down to 8.1%. Down to just that alone would take you under that 10% mark that so many uh, counties and states are using to determine, well, are we going to lock down or what, right? Just taking vitamin D alone decreased it dramatically. And that's just a small amount of vitamin D. That's not even what I would recommend. Okay, and then they found that those who had a vitamin D blood level of 55 nanograms per deciliter or higher only had 5.9% test positive. In other words, you can decrease from 12.5 to 5.9, more than a 50% drop in the total number of infected individuals, which means that that right there would, would, would result in a dramatic decrease of hospitalizations later on. Okay, so that's, that was on a preventive basis, just testing positive. We know on average that if you, if you have a, a higher level of vitamin D, if you're taking vitamin D on a regular basis, you're, 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 uh, or if you're not taking it on a regular basis, you're twice as likely to actually get infected. We didn't know that until fairly recently. We don't know. We, didn't, we thought that you were just as likely to get infected, but you weren't going to get as sick. Now we know that having optimal vitamin D lowers, dramatically lowers your risk of getting infected, Number two, if you get infected, it dramatically lowers the risk of, of having bad symptoms. Uh, and if you have bad symptoms and your vitamin D is up, you're much less likely to end up in a hospital with worse symptoms. Uh, and if you do end up in a hospital with symptoms, 
that you're much less likely to go on to intensive care. And finally, you're much less likely to die from it. So there's studies that document each and every step that I just outlined. You know, we don't have three, four hours to go over through all those studies today, but the, the bottom line is this. So how much should we take? Okay, so we know that the, the, doc, the research done by, by uh, uh, Dr. Robert Heaney from Creighton University School of Medicine is that every child, every child in, the, in our country should be on 2,000 units of vitamin D daily. 2,000. Okay, more than what the government recommends, even though he was the only vitamin D researcher at, on the FDA Board of Nutrition. And they, they still went follow his guidelines, even though he's the only one that knew what he was talking about. Okay, so, so 2,000. Okay, if you're an adult, you should be on about 4,000 units daily because it can take three, four months to build your blood levels up to where they should be. So that's just preventive. That's just kind of starting now, hoping that, you know, you don't get infected in the next two to three months while you're gradually building this up. Okay, now, the uh, other, other studies have shown that if, if you test positive or if, you, if you're starting to experience symptoms, then you should ramp up your vitamin D. And, and that's why I like to use the liquid. The liquid vitamin D, you can actually take a full dropper full or 25 drops, which is, if every drop is 2,000 units, that's 50,000 units. Now that sounds like a, a horribly excessive amount of vitamin D. No, it's not. Not if you're sick. Your body needs that to build up the stores of vitamin D that will then activate the innate immune system, which has been shut down by the virus, right? And so it helps decrease viral replication. It helps, it helps uh, uh, and then in the later stages of the illness, the inflammatory stage, it actually calms inflammation. It dramatically decreases the risk of what we call cytokine storm. So, so vi vitamin D is one of those rare, new, rare, rare therapies that helps you in the first phase by, by limiting viral replication, but it also is just as important, if not more important, in preventing death due to that cytokine storm, that inflammatory process that causes oxidative stress, that then causes uh, excess coagulation or blood clotting all throughout the, the, uh, where blood flows. And of course, that's what kills people with COVID is, is excessive blood clotting for the most part. So vitamin D helps limit that phase dramatically and it decreases uh, the, the clotting risk as well. Okay, so. I don't want to suggest here that vitamin D is a panacea and it's, you know, it's, it's the magic bullet and that, that, that's the cure-all. No, it's one of many steps that we should be taking advantage of. But unfortunately, 80% of people who end up in the hospital with COVID haven't been taking vitamin D. Okay, and therefore their blood levels are very low and they're at much higher risk of succumbing to this, uh, to this process. You know, there's, you know, there's the, so many studies that we could review, but uh, let, let's, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Well, well thank you. Uh, there's so many var variables just to, to kind of go into layers on this whole discussion of vitamin D, but I want to make sure we, we hit a couple of things that might be in the minds of people listening. One of them is, well, gee, if I go on walks on regular basis and I'm out in the sun, do I really need to take it? You know, what's, what's the story with sunlight versus taking vitamin D? Oh, man, that, that's such a great question because I hear that all the time, you know, and, and this is from my, my you know, I, I'm into natural medicine, right? I'm into natural health. I'm a lifestyle medicine doctor after all. Uh, and so I'm all for doing things as naturally as possible. And I learned the hard way. When I first found out about vitamin D being... About 20 years ago, there's a big Harvard study that showed that the amount of vitamin D in your blood has more to do with your risk of developing cancer than whether you smoke or not. I thought, what? That can't be real. That can't be true. So I started studying this, and I discovered that was true, that, that low vitamin D blood levels are, are, are basically uh, a kindling for cancer. Okay, and so 
uh, so as I started studying, I started checking everybody's vitamin D levels in my practice. This was when I was in Guam, in, in the mid-Pacific, right? Just, just very close to the equator. And I was outside for an hour and a half a day because I did a lot of lecturing at night. And so I, I, I was out in my bathing suit on Ipau Beach in Guam, you know, beautiful sunny afternoon. My vitamin D was low, even though I was out in the sun in, in a place that, that I was potentially getting more vitamin D than anybody in the United States. Good. And, and I see this all the time. It's ironic that in the Southern European states where there's more sun, they have lower vitamin D levels. Not because, not because sun doesn't work, it's because they're avoiding the sun because it's hot. <laughs> they're, 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 you can't make vitamin D in your, in your bare skin unless you're in midday sun. Not early morning sun, not late afternoon sun. You get zero vitamin D from that. So we, we, there's something, there's a term I coined called the sun shadow standard. It's you go outside and, and you kind of see where the sun is. And then you look at your shadow while you're standing up. And if your shadow is shorter than you are tall, meaning you know it's definitely midday in the summertime, then you're generating vitamin D. But if your shadow is longer than you are tall, you're making zero vitamin D, even if you're outside all day long. Okay, so in the wintertime, even here in San Diego, California, there's only like an hour in the midday that the sun is above 45 degrees in the sky. The rest of the time it's in the southern sky. And so it's really only about an hour, hour and a half that you could be out and make any vitamin D at all. Okay, so the, even if you're out a lot, you're, not, you're thinking, oh, I'm going for a walk on Saturday afternoon. I'm getting all this vitamin D. No, you're not. You're not getting any vitamin D if, it's, if, it's, uh, if the sun is, is below 45 degrees. So, so um, that's, that's why it's critical to check your own blood levels of vitamin D. I want to believe that until I started checking my own level in every single patient. And even in Southern California and in Guam, where I've spent most of my uh, 30 years of, uh, of lifestyle medicine practice, very few people are vitamin D sufficient unless they supplement. Very, okay. I mean, literally I could count on, on my hands the number of people in 30 years that were vitamin D sufficient. So expect to be deficient. And that's why we need to supplement as I suggested there. Uh, so, so that's, uh, uh, bottom line is if you're living above the 37th parallel, which most people in the United States do, okay, and, and, and most Europeans do as well, you're, you're not going to, you, you have like a five month vitamin D winter, meaning even if you're getting vitamin D. So by the way, sun, being outside in the sun is good for you for many reasons. We just cannot rely on it to make vitamin D, especially as we get older. Even in the summertime, those of us that are older are not generating the vitamin D very well because uh, it just doesn't work as well as it did when we were 20. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Now, uh, I know we're kind of getting uh, close to running out of time, and I really want to make sure we I, talk I wanna, about it. While you're thinking about that question, let me just, yeah. uh, I want to do a quote by Dr. Hugh Sinclair. You know, so much, so oftentimes in, in medicine and in, 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 in health education, we're looking for new studies. As if these studies like this have not been done before. <laughs> and, and, and so we've known the importance of these things for a hundred years. And so Dr. Hugh, uh, Hugh Sinclair, who lived over a hundred years ago, um, uh, observe the deficiency of any nutrient, which is essential for every tissue, will inevitably lead to abnormal function in every tissue. That is so incontrovertible uh, and so obvious that I am continually astonished, he says, it must be repeatedly, forcefully restated. So, so we're restating things that should be intuitively obvious uh, to the medical community, but, but sometimes uh, certain people in the medical community are more interested in criticizing the studies rather than getting on board and realizing that there's no downside 
there is literally no downside to doing this and and we could save literally you know uh, thousands tens of thousands of people over the next three months if everybody started doing what we suggest right now right how do we check for vitamin d dr youngberg say that again how do we check for vitamin okay, d okay so so I, I uh, you know, to ask your doctor to just measure a simple blood test. It's called 25-hydroxy vitamin D, or just ask for a vitamin D blood test. Now, unfortunately, uh, Medicare and other insurance companies won't pay for it, typically, um, unless they're not paying attention. That happens a lot. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but unless you have, like, a diagnosis of osteoporosis or or a previous vitamin D deficiency diagnosed. Uh, so, uh, but you can get this done uh, at clinics that, that uh, do self-pay blood tests um, for, for, for under, under $60. So you can go to, um, to uh, uh, vitamin D or, or, or labs online, uh, different labs that are online and you can order a vitamin D blood test for about $65. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't, don't avoid it just because insurance won't pay for it. This could save your life. I mean, I, I, we have all now had people that we knew that we cared for that have died from COVID or suffered s severely from COVID. And, and we're, we're suggesting here that this alone could make, make the difference. There was a, a last study in vitamin D. Uh, this was done by the University of Cordoba in Spain. And, and actually published in August of this year. Uh, and they, they took, it was, a, it was a double, it was a randomized double mass study, one of the best study that you can do, where they randomized people who were going to the hospital for COVID. In other words, they were sick enough to be in the hospital. They all got standard of care, okay? In fact, they all got hydroxychloroquine, they all got the Z, the, uh, the, the Z pack, they all got things that at the time, back in April was standard of care. And, um, but but uh, half of them got a, a, a starting dose, over 50,000 units of vitamin D on day one of admission. And then on day three, half that dose, day seven, half that dose. So you would think, well, that's, that's too late, right? They're already, they're already super sick, they're in the hospital, that they, they should have gotten it earlier. Vitamin D can help you at any phase of this condition. And you know what happened? the risk of going on to a critical care unit dropped from 50% to 2%. And the risk of dying dropped from 8% uh, to zero. Just because they added vitamin D on day one of hospital admission. Now that's pretty striking. And, and, and that study alone should be reason enough for, for you know, every hospital in the country and uh, the world to immediately give that bolus of vitamin D. And I say, why wait till you go to the hospital, right? Do it on the very first indication of symptom or if you know you got infected. Now, Dr. Yumber, were you and capsules uh, because it's it's you know it's clean you know it's totally clean but most of the reputable companies that are out there uh, that are there they make the vitamin D from lanolin it's basically expressed from sheep wool you know uh, uh, sheep make vitamin D and then it gets into their wool and then when the sheep are sheared the wool can be expressed and vitamin D comes out okay so uh, so it's, uh, it's technically not vegan in that respect, but, um, but you know, it's kind of like eating honey, you know, it's something that, that's expressed uh, by the sheep and it's vitamin D. So bottom line is however you feel comfortable getting vitamin D, do that. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line, do that. Okay, great, thank you for that. So, uh... There was a few more things that you had highlighted to me before, and I, I think it's worth you mentioning. Uh, you'd mentioned vitamin C, zinc citrate, quercetin and iodine and hydrothermal therapy. You wanna just, I know that's a lot to cover, but you wanna just touch on those? 
Yes, yeah. So there's, uh, you know, back back some months ago when there was a lot more discussion about using hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil uh, for people with COVID. Um, uh, they, what we knew is that that worked, especially if given with zinc. In other words, hydroxychloroquine didn't seem to work that well if somebody had low zinc levels in their blood. But if, but if they were given zinc or they already had zinc floating around through their blood, the hydroxychloroquine works through different mechanisms, including complexing with the zinc, transporting that zinc across the cell membrane into the cell where, where it can shut down the viral replication of COVID-19, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So, so that, that's the critical part right there. So, so that's why some of, the, some of the studies done on hydroxychloroquine were giving it in the second phase of the illness. Well, that's, you know, that's like giving somebody a bulletproof vest after they get shot, taking a picture, and then saying, see, this didn't work. Well, what? It's because you didn't give it that bulletproof vest at the right time, right? Or, or also akin to the, the notion of telling somebody to have a bulletproof vest that's just flimsy, that's, that's not that great, but calling it a, bullet, a therapeutic bulletproof vest. And then when they get shot, we say, see, this is proof that no, bullet, no bulletproof vests really work for this type of scenario. So, so we, it, that would be a, an analogy of dose. So just giving a, a little, a thousand uh, units of vitamin D or even just 2000 to adults probably isn't enough to get them through a serious infection. Okay, so, so we got to get the right dose and we got to use it at the right time, especially, so hydroxychloroquine probably worked really good if it was given initially Okay, not at the late stage after somebody's already on a ventilator, right? Uh, but either way, zinc is critical. And so what I do for my patients is I encourage them to take zinc anywhere from 50 to 100 milligrams a day with food only, otherwise you'll get nauseous, and then take quercetin, the bioflavonoid quercetin, 250, 500 milligrams as a way to work like hydroxychloroquine without maybe some of the side effects, that complexes the zinc and transports it into the cell. So, so that, that would be the zinc angle. And, and by the way, I test uh, plasma zinc, serum copper, and ceruloplasmin on every patient I work with. And, and I would say over 90% of my patients are low in zinc and excessively high in copper. The treatment for that is more zinc as well, which lowers oxidative stress associated with copper that promotes cognitive decline, promotes diabetes, promotes all these risk factors that make COVID more deadly. So, um, so, so optimizing zinc is actually a very, very critical thing to do, especially for people who have underlying issues or are overweight. And, and then we got hydrotherapy you mentioned. Uh, wow, well, we, you know, we could take a, talk a whole hour on that. Did you have a question on it? Well, hold on. Before you get to that, what about iodine? Because I know you've said before it kills COVID on contact, but kind of how does that play into all this? Okay, this is a tricky one because there's all kinds of different opinions in medicine about iodine. But um, uh, the, the bottom line is this. Dr. David Derry, a, a, a P, PhD MD uh, physician, uh, back in 2009, I believe, uh, did a, a, a wonderful paper published in a thyroid uh, medical journal showing that iodine was probably the best antiviral to use in, in viral respiratory pandemics, such as what we have now. And, and he was recommending that you can actually use iodine spray. Like I have this little potassium iodide bottle. And you can spray this. Okay, I don't know if you can see the mist. You can spray this in your nostril. A couple sprays each nostril. This is only 150 micrograms per drop. And you can spray it into your lungs. Uh, and, and there are studies for, for like dentists and periodontists that if they do this every couple hours, that they, they're basically killing any 
any uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus that's in the mouth, in the, in the lungs, or in the sinuses, instant, within 15 seconds, they're all gone. Well, and you've also- Studies that have been done for, for uh, dental practices in particular, because of course they're dealing with oral secretions all day long, right? Right. Uh, so they, they have their patients use it and they themselves use it every couple hours. And so I do this every morning when I shave, I, I do this as a, as a barrier to viruses. Viruses, you know, basically I'm, I'm, I'm recruiting some uh, SEAL 6 team, you know, SEAL Team 6 in, into my nostrils and my lungs and they don't let any viruses through. You know, it just kills them on contact. And so, so it's, after the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918, 1919, the government, the US government did 25 years of research on what do we do if this ever happens again? Their final conclusion was iodine. Mm -hmm. Iodine is the most powerful antiviral bar none. And yet you don't hear about it too much. I mean, you know, surgeons use the betadine. We're not talking about putting betadine in our mouth. That would, that, that, that would be a little toxic, right? This is just pure nutritional iodine, potassium iodide. Uh, so, so there's, on my website, dryoungberg.com, I have an immune protocol that walks people through how to use iodine properly because there's a lot of improper ways to use it. So, so, so make sure you, you do that properly. And don't now, just yeah. use any iodine. You can't use Lugol's iodine and spray it up your nose. That'll light you up for a, a, a day or a week. <laughs> And you had also mentioned taking that same bottle and just uh, take your glasses off and spray it in the air and let it drop in your eyes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I do that. This, so this, this, protects, this protects your eyes from, from viral particles, you know, that might be aerosolized. Uh, so it, it's just very, very protective. And again, it's one of many strategies. I, I would never do this all by itself even though all by itself, it will lower your viral load dramatically, which decreases your risk of getting very sick or being hospitalized, even if you do get infected. So let me ask a, an, an analogy question. Is the strategies you're talking about versus what's happening with COVID, is it kind of like a war where your immune system is one set of troops and COVID is another set of troops? Because you talk about viral load and whoever has the most troops that are strong wins? Is that a kind of a good well, way that, to- That would definitely be one way to look at it. Yeah, it, it, it's, there's no question that viral load is a huge determinant in, in who gets really sick and who dies. And so if you get a big viral load and your immune system is, is shut down for five to seven days during the viral replication phase, that bigger load of virus is going to end up being a much bigger load after five, six days. And, and that, that right there could make the difference between somebody who survives the cytokine storm or who never even gets to the point where they need to go to the hospital. Well, you know what's interesting? We had someone locally, and Scott knows I think who I'm talking about, uh, relatively healthy guy, maybe a little overweight, but actually in pretty good shape. I'm guessing it was in his 40s and he passed away from COVID and we were all in shock. And I asked a good friend of his, I said, what was going on in his life at the time that might have contributed to this? And he said, well, you know, he had just taken a job to work as a mechanic at night mm -hmm. and he was in the process of switching his sleep cycle so that he could stay awake at night and do this job. And this is right at the same time he got the po test of positive COVID. Yeah, that, that's, that's very intuitive. That's huge, huge issue that, that just making that transition during that transition phase, you're at much higher risk of, uh, of a depressed immune system. In fact, many of us can attest to this is that when we catch that cold or flu is if, if we stay up late studying for a test or, or preparing some, some uh, prod, getting some project ready, when we stay up late, especially if it's more than two to three hours later than usual, we're sitting ducks. Our immune system, that innate immune system has basically been turned off. It's, it's we're, we're wide open to any opportunistic virus that wants to take over. And so if we just happen to get exposed during that, uh, the few days before or after that event, then we're gonna be a, in harm's way. 
Uh, so, so that's why sleep is so critical. Uh, getting optimizing your sleep is really a very important strategy. Getting to bed earlier is much healthier than going to bed late and getting up late. So getting to bed early, uh, getting up early, you know, uh, can make you healthy, wealthy, and wise, as somebody said. <laughs> so, so that's, that's important. The other thing is avoiding sugar. We, one thing that we've learned about elderly, one reason elderly are um, uh, in some cases more susceptible to COVID isn't necessarily because of their age, but because as their taste buds change, they tend to eat more and more desserts. They tend to eat more sweet things. And of course, sugar, it shuts down the immune system. So, right. so be very, very careful. That's another key strategy here. Uh, you want to eat very, very plainly, uh, very simply when you're susceptible to COVID. And, and of course, we're all susceptible right now because of the time of year and because it's spreading like wildfire. Everybody's going to get exposed or infected at some point. So be ready. Fortify your immune system appropriately. Um, and with that, you said eat simply. Do you have some suggestions what you mean by eat simply? The, so if we're sick, if we, you know, if we wake up one morning and go like, oh man, I just, I just feel a little kind of sore and, you know, those, those achy feelings that you get when you get a flu Chill. or, you know, you just don't feel yourself. So at that point, you don't want to be thinking uh, how big of a breakfast I can have. You want to eat very lightly. You want to, you want to limit your intake, maybe have some, you know, tomato soup or, or, you know, just something real simple. Um, don't, don't overdo that. Um, just cut, cut your, cut your calories significantly. Uh, eat. Okay. But make sure you're hydrating more. Make sure that you're, you're resting more because when your body is in digestive mode, your immune system isn't as strong. Okay, now I'm not saying completely fast. I mean, you can do some of that, but, but you need to eat some, but sparingly. And then you want to do that hydrotherapy that you alluded to earlier, Susan, that where you're doing hot and cold contrast uh, with, with hot and cold water in a shower or in a tub or in a sauna uh, or using a dry thermophore that you just plug in to the wall and you, and you have a thermophore on your back and on your chest, and you just heat up for like three to five minutes, and then you take an ice cold washcloth and rub it over your chest and your back, and then dry that off. And you got to usually have to have somebody help you with that. And then, and then you go right back to the thermophore or to the fomentations, which is there's there's actually on my website dryoungberg.com there is video clips on how you can do all these hot cold contrasts showers or contrast fomentations or using a thermophore uh, to basically do what's called uh, thermal therapy. You're heating up the body and then cooling it off and that wakes up the immune system. It actually bypasses the, the defect that up to 14% of people who succumb to COVID die because they're not able to mount an interferon response. They can't, they can't produce interferon and therefore interferon is not available to stimulate the immune system. But if you do the a hot shower followed by cold, followed by hot back and forth three times, that activates your innate immune system without requiring interferon. And so you're, you're basically getting the benefit of, your, of interferon even though, you, even though you can't make it. So that right there could save a lot of people that otherwise didn't know that they were gonna potentially die from this because their body wasn't working, their immune system wasn't working properly. You know, I've always been told that what's happening when you're doing it, so tell me if this is correct, is that you're kind of tricking your body to think you're, you have a fever. And so it, the white blood cell count shoots up to try to fight that. And then I'm not sure what the cold part does, but then you just, like you said, do it this whole process three times and it just makes it far, you know, generate even more and more white blood cells. Yeah, that right? and that's, that's true. That's what we, what we have said for many years. Now we know though, it's not, it's not tricking the body. It's actually creating a fever. It's actually right. getting your body temperature up to like 
103 or at least 101, 102. And once you hit that level, you're, you're activating the immune system. And then the cold in itself is also therapeutic. It activates other aspects of the immune system as well. Excellent, excellent. Now, well, do we, we want to leave some time for, uh, to make sure we answer some questions here. So uh, I'm going to shift our gears to that point, if you don't mind, Susan. Okay. Is there a particular, Katie, do you have some questions for us to? Yes. So we received a few questions in the chat. Um, and one of the questions was, is ivermectin a good preventative to take if you are at high risk? So, so the, the, this goes back to the principle I mentioned earlier, which is, um, which is if, if you have the first phase of, of, the, of the illness is the viral replication phase. So any antiviral taken early on during the viral replication phase should be beneficial and should be taken advantage of. Once you've crossed into the inflammatory phase, taking an antiviral is not going to be helpful. Okay, um, uh, so you have to focus on anti-inflammatories. At that point, you, you have the uh, dexamethasone or uh, other steroidal uh, uh, anti-inflammatories or even natural anti-inflammatories like vitamin D, for instance, and, and quercetin, uh, uh, the, or curcumin rather, uh, even quercetin is anti-inflammatory. There's a lot of things that are anti-inflammatory that we can take advantage of uh, naturally. So, um, so likewise, taking the anti-inflammatories that, that are medicines, that are prescription medicines, like dexamethasone or steroids, during the first phase actually makes it worse. So once again, we're learning uh, the timing is critical and when we use these therapies and, and our, our ICU doctors and, and hospitalists are starting to recognize you got to give it at the right time or else it can actually be worse for them. Okay. Now, uh, someone just reminded us on the chat that we haven't discussed vitamin C. What, what would you like to share okay. on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, on vi vitamin C is, um, is um, basically if you're, if you're sick, with a respiratory or any type of infection, you can crank up the vitamin C to bowel tolerance. In other words, take as much as you can uh, handle without having uh, gassiness or diarrhea. Now that's really the only real side effect of it. And you'll know, you know, if you're, if you're running to the bathroom with, with uh, blowout diarrhea, you know, okay, I did way more than I needed. <laughs> and that's why you just start with maybe 500 to 1000 milligrams and then gradually build up from that. And that, that would be a good preventive strategy where you use 500 to 1,000 milligrams. By, by the way, vitamin C is almost always significantly deficient in hospitalized patients who have infections. And, and that's one of the reasons they get, they get multiple blood clots is because the oxidative stress has used up all the vitamin C and now it's easy to form these blood clots. Whereas if you're taking vitamin C throughout the whole process, your body's going to have sufficient levels of the vitamin C to act as antioxidants and in a very oxidative environment of COVID-19. Awesome. Great. Another question we received was, does vitamin D interfere with other medications, kind of like blood pressure medications? Uh, that's actually a great question, believe it or not. I've never even heard that question before. Never even thought of that question before. There, there is no evidence that I'm aware of, and I've been, I've been studying this hard for 20 years, that it would in any significant clinical way interfere with, with uh, other medications. Vitamin D, uh, even when taken in very large doses, you know, because somebody's sick, um, is just you're just building up your blood stores of vitamin D is what you're doing. You're filling up the well so you have you have enough of it uh, when the time is right. Excellent. Well, um, we have come to the end of our hour. This has flown by as we knew it would, Dr. Youngberg. 
Yeah. Um, I want to let everybody know, number one, that this will be posted to our website. We have a resource page for the Vitality series, so you can um, access this uh, webinar at any time. I think we also have a YouTube channel. And that's and the Brighton Heights website. Yes, the Brighton Heights website, brightonheights.org. We also have a Brighton Heights YouTube channel, and we have a Brighton Heights Facebook page. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Katie, we'll have the, this webinar available on all of those locations. Is that right? Yes. So following this webinar, we will have it posted at brightonheights.org slash vitality dash series. It will also be on the Facebook page, which is, which is at Brighton Heights. And then it will be on the YouTube page where you can search Brighton Heights. Very good. The other thing we want to tell you is that we're going to, have a webinar like this every month. It's our goal to just keep this thing going and keeping it alive. And so if you want to jot this down, although we will, you know, post it on our website and in other locations and we'll send out emails to those of you who have uh, received this information via email, that uh, the next date is Wednesday, or excuse me, Monday, December 14th at the same time. So it'll be 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, and of course that's 3 p.m. Central. And the topic uh, is kind of kind of take from where we are on this topic and just kind of ease into the relationship between diabetes, COVID, and even cognitive decline that he's going to start showing the interrelationship between all these um, both chronic conditions as well as why this uh, COVID thing is also just happens to latch on to people who, who may have those conditions as well. Dr. Youngberg, anything else you want to add about that topic? Well, it's, it's actually a very exciting topic because as I work with all kinds of these, all these type of patients, I've seen a, a direct relationship. So even those of us that are not afraid of COVID, one of the problems is that getting infected, even if we don't end up in the hospital, can leave us, can leave, leave us with what's called uh, a long hauler or, or a post viral uh, syndrome. And women in particular are four times more likely to have this long hauler syndrome, which is like a form of chronic uh, fatigue syndrome. It's kind of like the new Lyme disease. And so th this, is, this is starting to become a bigger and bigger issue. And so that can affect cognition. It can in impact cognitive decline. And of course it makes diabetes worse and diabetes makes that worse. So, um, so we're going to be kind of look at the, the, the relationship between all three of these and what else we can do besides the simple strategies we outlined today uh, to, to improve our health during uh, challenging times that we live in. Excellent. I'm wondering, well, we Susan, wanna... if we can, uh, if, if we can, there's obviously going to be questions that we didn't get to answer and maybe we can, uh, formulate those that we didn't answer and post those on some of our uh, platforms as well. Very good. And also, I know Dr. Youngberg, you shared with us a kind of, and I think you even showed it to the screen, a one page document that um, summarizes vitamin D for prevention and management of COVID. If it's all right with you, well, uh, could we also post that to our website as well? Yes, that'd be fine. Okay. The one so I for those of you last night, right? Yeah. So yeah. for those of you watching, if you're wanting more specific information that he obviously covered fairly quickly today about how to use vitamin D3 and when and doses, et cetera, it'll be in that one page document and you can um, download that and use that for your benefit and to share with others. So we want to thank you all for your time and thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. Have a great Blessings. evening. Until next Thank month. Thank you, Dr. Youngberg. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.